So good to see you again, my brother. How have you been? Man, blessed by the best. Yourself, too it's anointed same. to be disappointed. <laughs> too anointed to be disappointed. I have not heard yeah. that one. That is good. Yeah. Um, so we had to cut off last time. But in this second part, obviously, I want to pick up where we left off, which is, if I'm not mistaken, you were in that chapel, right? And you were saying, why is Jesus, why is Jesus not here? And you're looking at Mary. And you started crying, but because of what? Remind me why, what hit you in that moment? Was it? Was that um, I could feel this like rush come over me and she literally was telling me your eternal salvation came from my womb. That's right. So we we know Moses couldn't even see the backside of God. Remember, he had like horns of light blazing out of his forehead. And but Mama Mary was able to contain the divinity of God within her womb. And she said yes to God. And I when I heard that, I was like, it blew me away. I just started crying, went in there receive the rest of it because mama Mary has always been the biggest um, and one of the biggest um, things for me to overcome until I was able to see it um, explicitly and implicitly in scriptures, how she's my mama too. But that was always those big for all those converts. Those are, that's like one of our biggest hangups right there because we feel like there's an adoration going her direction. But when we know it's not an adoration, it's just a high form of honor, respect and veneration for the mother of God. Come on. He, he he couldn't even speak on the cross. Seven things he said. And one of the things he did was he made sure he gave his mom to us and gave us to his mom. And so uh, she's she has a very special um, part in um, salvation history and turning the water into wine, being there at the cross, saying yes to the to the good angel Gabriel, where Eve said yes to the bad angel. So we see these these typologies, not just Jesus being the new Adam, but Mama Mary being the new Eve. The more deeper that I started digging into it, I started seeing all these revelations. And I was like, oh, wow, this is wow. this is different. But back now, let's go back there now. So I felt great. I went in there. It was a conversion story. Fred Krause. This was at Virgin Most Powerful Radio Studios. So where I first met Terry Barber and received a book, um, How to Share Your Faith. It's an evangelization book that Terry Barber had wrote at one time years ago, years ago, and Joshua Bencourt was with me, and we got an autograph one. And I left, and I felt really, okay, let's do this. this is something different happening in my life now, but uh, it still didn't happen like that. You know, everybody would think that, oh, you had this spectacular moment with the Blessed Virgin, and your life's just going to change. But remember, I was um, still doing my drugs, still doing coke, crystal meth, smoking a lot of marijuana, drinking, partying. And so even though my I was reaching, my 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 soul was willing, my spirit was willing, but my flesh is always weak. It's always this battle that we go through our entire lives, learning how to mortify our flesh, learning how to know that there's like a spiritual warfare going on 24-7 in battling. And that's what I, that's what I understand now. So what happened was I leave there, I start going to RCIA, I started attending RCIA for a month. Vicky and Danny Centurione, beautiful Catholic couple. Do they have a story? They're gonna be. I'm gonna have them on my, on my um, podcast soon. But incredible story. And they took me under their wing. They didn't see this tattooed skinny guy because nobody really knew. You just see me on fire, but you don't realize that I'm doing drugs in the background. You don't realize that I'm being an abusive boyfriend and fornicating and gangbanging and doing all kinds of stuff like this is back in 2015 they don't realize it. they just see me when i go to church they just see it kind of like what i was doing when i was protestant you know yep. i was going and partying during the week and on the weekends i would go serve god and they took me i started learning rcia I started reading the church fathers um saint ignatius of antioch in particularly saint polycarp saint just saint justin the martyr saint Arrhenius, so forth a lot of different ones the didache and all that i started just really just take pieces of it i started reading and i started um because you know we have access to the internet and it started it was really interesting that the church goes back two thousand years i had never i had never fathomed that and so in this moment it was about a month so i started studying a little bit rca attending mass weekly actually more than the woman who was Catholic that I was living with, you know, um, and her friends became my friends. I started attending a lot of different, all kind of like a parish hop 
because I was still using and living here and there. And, sure. and then so finally I went to a Crucio and I was like, okay, let's do a Crucio. I get invited to Crucio. Have you ever been to Crucio before? I, I've not gone, gone myself, but can you, for those that have that know nothing about it, can you describe what it is? It's just an intimate retreat. I can't say more than that because what happens in Crucio, they say if people don't know about it, kind of like with the Axe Retreat and other retreats, um, it's just this personal intimate moment with rekindling your relationship to Jesus Christ in the church and to God, the father, you know, it's just really just the first night was just in silence. Just for instance, I'm just to say this. And they gave me the cross, the guy who was strung out, the guy who was coming from Orange County. I had just came from work. Um, this is at, in Norco right here in Riverside. And they gave me the cross while they were hold, while they were praying the chaplet and the rosary, man, it was just like, I was blown away. And the whole weekend, it was just beautiful. They have a lot of different talks talk they teach you about the church what the rosary is our lady of guadalupe all kinds of different really intimate stuff it, it comes back from like the 40s from spain really into charismatic movement you know really intimate stuff i really enjoy a lot of adoration just prayer yeah. worship uh, mass every day confessions and so i went to that man i didn't want to go you want to know the truth i didn't want to leave i remember i can remember like it was yesterday i was man Lord, please let me just stay here I don't want to go back out there because I've been sober for four days now. I was like, Lord, please, I don't want to leave. 2015, I don't want to go. If I go, I know I'm going to go back to using again. And I just, I don't want to go back to that. I feel so like, I felt so complete. Um, and I ended up taking off. I ended up going because you, you leave Crucio. You got to leave the retreats over. And it's like when you clean your house with those seven demons, if you don't close the door and put bars and security gates and alarms and all this other kind of stuff around you, you know, they're going to come back and they're going to come back with friends this time because they're going to be pissed off that you kicked them out. And that's what happened this time was you would think that I'm going in the right direction, the Crucio, um, going to the uh, Sacred Heart Chapel with um, a virgin, seeing the stories, what happened with the, with, with the Blessed Virgin, the things that are going on in my life, how I'm starting to learn, become studious. And yeah. I never became studious for history of church like that in my life. You think I would have went in the right direction. But no, when I got out, I started using drugs, the worst I've ever used in my life. I started becoming extremely abusive. I started gangbanging out of control, always having a gun on me. I got my car impounded, um, went on high speed chases, just, just to name some things, jumping out of two yeah. story windows, two story windows, butt naked, running from the cops. I'm just like, that's how I was demented. I had been taken over. There was a legion of demons that were taking me over and nobody could stop me. Everybody that I was around, I was hurting everybody. I didn't want to be around people. I would hide from people just because I was so in this demonic state of mind. I was just losing myself. I had no relationship with God, even though I said I did. I was just, I was out of this world, sleeping from one house, woman's house, to another woman's house, to another woman's house, losing my mind. And I did that for about um, two months. And I stopped talking to people, you know, I, I people that were my Catholic brothers and sisters. I just, I didn't want no one to see that I was on drugs like this. And so yeah. I pushed away. And I just got tired of it, you know. I just got tired of it. I got tired of being tired really big time this time. I was just like, man, dude, I'm on the streets. I'm living place to place. I'm 115 pounds. And I remember driving down the road one day, and I was just like, I need to stop. This is getting old. This is just, what am I doing? And I drove right in front of this church called Our Lady of the Rosary Cathedral. And the doors were open. Every morning at 7 o'clock, they opened. And the lights were on. The, the doors were open. And I could have went into Mass. I, I know this about that church because it's my parish now, actually. Yeah, yeah I, I live like two blocks away. Weird. I never even lived in this area, but I live two blocks away from it. It's it's just God's providence. And I could have went inside that church that day. I told God, please, like, please take this drug habit away from me. Please take these addictions, this anger, this, this hate, this spite, everything who I was as a person, please, this lust this violence that I had in me, please just like remove it. That's not who I am. I want to be who you need me to be, Lord. And, you know, and I begged him that day to take this addiction away from me. I said, if you, if you take away, and you said, if I ask you anything in your name that you would give it to me, and I'm asking you, please like take this away from me. I don't want to use it no more. I was so bad. I was horrible. Um, but I didn't go in the church. I ended up going to this woman's house and, and then doing a little bit of drugs and messing. I was somebody that I was frequenting at a woman's house I was frequenting at. And I just, I went to sleep and I woke up and she was going through all my pockets. 
looking for money or drugs. And literally, I jumped up and I grabbed her by her neck and I slammed her. I was like, you guys need to know, you need to know what God, the work of God. That's why I'm saying all these extra little things, even though there's a hundred times more. Trust me, I'm just giving you sure. this um, in my whole lifetime of who I was as a person. But I'm just giving you this story right here, that metanoia moment. And so then I got her by her neck, I throw up against the wall and I'm just like, I'm choking her and then something goes through my head like, what are you doing? You're freaking out, man. Because I probably had slept like three hours in like in a month, three hours in like three weeks, just out of my, literally out of my mind. That's what happened. It's now demonic forces are taking over your brain, your mind. You're just, you're not allowing yourself to be who you need to be. You're like, you're like tainting your soul with staying up that long, doing all those drugs. And I just thought about it. And I go, you know what? I got to get clean. I put her down. I, I gave her the drugs I had. I gave her some money. I took a shower, shaved. I went to, I knew I had to get clean. I had to go to my grandma's house. My grandma's my Catholic nana. Rest her soul. Rest her soul. Mm. All her novenas is what made me strong, what made me being proud of being Catholic. I know it is never giving up and being able to change and get sober. But I went to her house. I said, you know what? I got to go to her house. I got to get clean. I know she can help me get clean. And as I go over there, I didn't realize that I had a warrant. So I had a warrant for a domestic violence from two weeks before that. And they were the police from a city 30 minutes away were staking out my grandma's house. So they were doing a stakeout. For domestic violence, I know everybody thought I was some kind of like drug dealer or like big time like mafia guy, the way they were staking out the house. Because you would think, for, even though it was a bad crime, anytime anybody is violated, it's a bad crime. But usually they don't do stakeouts for domestic violence, especially when there was no like marks or bruises or anything. Nobody was injured like that. So I go into my grandma's house. I say hi to her. I love you. Give her a hug, you know. She goes, you look so good. I know I did. I weighed 115 pounds. I weigh I weigh 199 right now. So just imagine 115 pounds. I'm 199 right now. Unbelievable. And so, yeah, and I know. And so then I go, I go in there, and then my dad's in there too. Actually, rest his soul too. My dad was a good. My dad was a good man, but my dad, he did drugs. My dad was a gang member for a lot. But of he years was of there. He was there with your grandma. My, he was in the bedroom he had he lived my grandma took care of my dad for a long time before he and she did both passed away you know she he died while i was in prison from cancer and my grandma just died two months ago um well she's right down the road her our grave's right down the road right here but i know i have i have somebody praying for me in heaven that's it's just it's bigger than i could even imagine because i even promised god all the things that i do all the graces that he's going to give me for like mass or prayer or for evangelizing or for anything that I do, any time the graces are given to me, I don't even want them. Push them over to my grandma. So if by chance she does have to make a little stint in purgatory, which is possible, let all the graces that I'm receiving for the things that I'm doing for the next five years be given to her so that she can make an easy passage through purgatory. And so, you know, and so I go in there, I go see my dad, but immediately, like, after I see my dad, because I see my grandma first, she hugs me. I go into the bedroom and I see my dad and he's like, where's the drugs at? No, seriously. That's just how we were. We did drugs for a long time from a young age of my life, maybe from like 13 years old, right before my 13th birthday, me and my dad were doing drugs together. And so I'm like, dude, I need to get clean, man. I need to get clean. At that time, my grandma comes in. She goes, go, go park your car. I go park my car to go parallel park. What I didn't realize was they were staking out the place. So there was a, they were staking out, they're looking for me. I, it just happened to be on that day, I came over there and they were there. So I go and I pull up and I go to parallel park. And I just know there's a lot of things running through my mind. I'm just, I, I want to get right. You know, I, well, I don't think anybody has the intention of wanting to be a, a drug addict and a, and a loser in their life. I don't think anybody has the intention of wanting to have any kind of diseases or to hurt people. I think growing up, that's not the intention, but the imperfection of life and society and the hurts, habits, and hangups, the things that we go through as people, they develop how we become. But rest assured that with God, all things are possible, you know? All things are possible. He changes everything. I just wanted to add that in there. So I go to Parallel Park. This unmarked SUV car comes up behind me. Before this moment, just know this. All I had known my entire life was being homeless. 
never doing my own responsibilities, never paying my own bills, never taking care of my son like I'm like I was supposed to be doing, never being a good son, never being a good grandson, never being a good friend, never being a good brother, or never being a good disciple of Jesus Christ. Always a half, half walking Christian. Always. Never loved myself. I always hated myself. I was selfish. Always, my entire life, there was nothing, you know, I wouldn't say I was a bad person, but this is who I became and all the choices that I made afterwards. I don't care if I was hurt when I was younger. I could still make decisions to change, but I continued for a long time to make decisions that just continue to hurt people. You know, it just continued to hurt people. I was very selfish. And so I jump in my car, I go to Parallel Park. And as I go to Parallel Park, an unmarked SUV comes up behind me. And I don't know if I bumped into them or they bumped into me because I had the music on and I wasn't really looking. And so they bumped me. And when I look into my rear view mirror, I see two guys jump out of an SUV, one with a shotgun, one with a pistol, both coming up the side of my, my getting out of their car and going to come up the side. Hats on backwards, lokes. I automatically thought it was people because I had picked up a big drug debt, probably like three or $4,000 worth of drugs I owed. I just kept on getting more and then doing it, not selling it, just doing it, you know. And they had been shooting at me and I had been getting in tussles and stabbed and fights. And when I saw these people pull up on me, that's who I thought they were. And so immediately, but even if I would have known they were cops at that time, I still would have ran. You know, this is let's, let's just be the reality of it is. Um, but I didn't know there were cops at that moment. So I take off in a high speed chase and I am. Yeah, I take off. So as I bump into them like this, boom, as I go backwards, they enemy like this, I take off. Boom, I go on a high speed chase through Loma Linda and five minutes. And that's that's all it takes. You don't think right when you're not living right, when your focus isn't Christ centered. It's easy for you to go away and do stupid knuckle knuckleheaded things, even though we proclaim to love Jesus. You know, uh, it's something that we all have to work on. You know, that's that fall of man. But thank God for God, He gives us the strength. Um, so I go on this high speed chase, and I'm driving in my rearview mirror because when you're tweaking, you drive in your rearview mirror because you like want to know who's behind you because you can kind of like go like that. And so as I'm driving and looking in my rearview mirror, I notice that they are police. I can see sirens in the inside of the window now of the of the vehicle. And as I'm looking up, I'm like, ah, they're cops. I go to look forward. I'm at an intersection now, and it's a red light. And I'm about to hit the back of a car. And I immediately, I jump into the bike lane, and I, I fly over to the bike lane. And immediately as I jump into the bike lane, Randolph Stevenson, rest his soul. Rest his soul. I know he's, I know he's praying for me. I know I really believe that from the bottom of my heart. He's praying for me because a beautiful man lost his life that day. My life will never be the same. Like I told you, I think I gave you, I, I tried to give you a description of who I was before this event, okay? Of who I was before this event. I lived on the streets for a year at a time. You know, I'm just saying I was in prison for years at a time. I was a drug addict for years at a time. I hurt everybody for years. I stole from everybody. I didn't care. And um, I jumped in that bike and my life will never be the same again it won't like i'm i'm truly blessed right now but it i really wish it wouldn't have happened like this but things happen like this and i can't i can't explain it all i know is i gotta make reparation for it now like uh, they call me mr reparation because i'm trying to repair the things that i've messed up so much in my life before maybe not directly um but indirectly in living amends you know yeah. so i hit him and i hit him and he, i hit him on the bike and i still go about another 100 yards and I spin out and so just messed up mindset I even took off running from the scene I even took off running from the scene like a loser yeah I was pathetic that's why I call myself all those names of who I was before you know only God can make things new and they caught me I go to prison I mean I go to jail I'm fighting my case people are coming to my cell trying to give me bibles I'm throwing the bibles away from me I don't want nothing to do with God I'm a fake. Um, I'm about to do life in prison. They're going to give me 15 years to life. And I'm just like, I couldn't even think about my victim. I couldn't even think about my, my family or his family or the community that had been hurt. All I could think about was my selfishness. All I could think about was the fact that, oh, I'm going to do life in prison. 
I became very selfish, to be honest with you. My son turned his back on me and he called me a fake Christian. He didn't want to talk to me because he found out I murdered that I killed somebody. I murdered somebody. That's what it was. It was a it was a murder, plain and clear. And I and I told him that I'm gonna do 15 years to life. And he actually called me a fake Christian. I thought you were a Christian, hung up the phone on me. Um, and that hurt me because everybody else is already rejecting me, you know. And to have him do that too. It, it was just like, I just felt sorry for myself. Let's just keep on going back. I didn't feel sorry for him that he had to have a father who just did this. Yep. Mother who's going through the pains. I have family who's law enforcement too. Everybody has to see my picture on the news and all over California news and stuff like that. It's that's embarrassing. And so I wasn't thinking about that. So I made a noose. I made a noose out of my sheet, ripped up my sheet, braided it up really good. I was about to hang myself in my cell. Has because there's bars like an old school cells that have bars on it. Nobody was in my cells by myself, but I wanted to give my son one last call, and I did give him a call. You know, I because I wasn't even praying. I wasn't praying or nothing for the first month. I wasn't. I was just feeling sorry for myself. And then all of a sudden, I called my son up and I said, "You know what? I just want to tell you, I love you. I'm proud of you. You're amazing. I don't know if it was something you heard in my voice, or it was that." God wanted him to tell me something, but he told me, I love you, dad. I forgive you. And I can't wait to see, and I can't wait to see you again. And we were just talking about this the other day, me and my son, but cause he doesn't realize that, um, how many times, like I've talked about my story with people and like shared with my friends and family, how that impact of this moment that, and I had to tell him about it this last week and like, and he didn't know about it. I was like, yeah, like that day, cause he's 17 now. I was like, this was going to happen. But when you told me this, this is what happened. And I went back to my cell and I, for three days, I begged God for forgiveness for three days. I begged him. I said, please, Lord, I'm sorry. Everything I've ever done, all, all the people I've ever hurt, all the people I've ever disappointed, all the people that I've ever led astray, like, I'm sorry. And I begged him for days. I wouldn't eat. I couldn't sleep. And I just begged him. I, I please, Lord, please. I'm so sorry. And I just, I could envision every single woman that I've heard in my life. Um, all my family, not being a good son, not being a good um, father, Randy and his family, it's like everybody started rushing into me. And I was thinking in my life, I was thinking like, why did I do all these things? Why did I become this person, you know? And I begged him for forgiveness. And I just told him, if, if anything, just use me. Like, I don't care if I do life, just use me. I don't care if I do life in prison. It's I've done so many bad things to people, you know? I've done so many hurtful things to people. Like, just use me so people don't have to make the same mistakes that I have. Just use me so we can help break habits, so we can help break addictions. Just use me while I'm in here because people are coming in and out. I'm fighting my case, but people are coming in and out, in and out. And I'm seeing this, like, this um, revolving door. And, like, I'm like, Lord, just use me. Help me to be this light for you inside of here. And I just felt like this forgiveness, all of a sudden it's like forgiveness just hits me, you know? And it's just like, I just felt it. I just, just I love you, Lord. And from that moment forward, I knew it. I, I says, it has to be different. I can't just act like, because I've been locked up a hundred times in my life. You know, I've heard a lot of people in my life, it had to be different this time. It is something that had to be different this time. I remember I had already gone through my Protestantism and Jehovah Witnesses, Protestant, nothing changed. I was reading the scriptures. But it had to be different now. I already had I had already reached out to Catholicism. So I made sure that that day I called my mom and I told her to send me a Bible. Or the next day, like that was after I had four to five days after I talked to my son. Catholic Bible. I don't want just a Bible, but I want a Catholic study Bible. I want a Bible I could study off of. Like I could do the Thompson New King James study Bible. I want a Catholic study Bible so I can have Catholic doctrine. She gave me an NBRSC or something like that. I like that one. I'm an ESV and Dewey Reigns fan myself, but that one's all right. It's kind of it's kind of a little liberal, but I I dig it. You know, I made a rosary. My friend, uh, one of my Mexican friends that were in there that were Catholic, a rosary out of a trash bag because we didn't have no we didn't have we couldn't have rosaries where I was at. So we made a rosary out of a trash bag for me, and then people were sending me in pamphlets. I would have a couple of friends who still were like, they were disappointed in me, but they would still send me stuff. That one woman that I would, that I was telling you about that I was with, she 
would come and see me and she would send me Catholic material still. And other, my spiritual moms and Danny and Vicky Centurioni, Joshua Bencourt, they didn't give up on me. The catechism of the Catholic Church came in and I kept on praying. And then every day I would go and put a scripture on everybody's cell. On each cell, I would put a scripture, and I started having studies. And whoever was Catholic, I started wanting to teach. I started wanting to share the faith. And I'm the new. I'm not even Catholic yet, but I'm learning. I'm reading it, and I want to share it. You know, I meet a friend in there named Santos Aguilera. His dad is a deacon in the, in our in our faith um, in Hesperia, about thirty minutes from me. But he had been falling away. So when he came back in, I was able to groom him. And for like four years, we followed each other. For like three years, wherever I would go, he would follow me. So I would help him with his faith. I would help him grow in who what we believe is Catholics. Because as converts, we want to we want to know all the nitty gritty of the faith. Why do we do this? What's the imperticures? What's the liturgy? You know, like there's just the lectionary. We can just keep on going forever. It's tradition, magisterium. He never knew none of those things. So the the foundation of the church. And so I started teaching him all these things. We became best friends. I continued going, but there was still a hurt, a brokenness in my heart because I couldn't forgive myself. You know, as I was growing still in jail, this is just in jail, not in prison yet. I couldn't forgive myself. And I wrote the diocese and I told them, please, I need a priest to come over here. I know I'm not Catholic. I need to do confession. I need someone to talk to, please, because this is who I am. And I just wrote this long letter to them, and they sent me a priest. His name was Father Stephen Porter. I was baptized as a baby Catholic, even though I was never with, into Catholicism until later in my ages. I was baptized at St. Catherine of Siena in Rialto, California, by Father Louis Marx. Rest his soul, okay? Rest his soul. They sent me a priest to come talk to me from the church that I had been baptized as a baby. They didn't know that though. <laughs> that's God. You know, you know how God does it. And I was, I was like, you're from St. Catherine. I was like, that's where I was baptized as a baby. He's like, what? And he's from South Africa. Amazing priest. He's there talking to me. We're speaking. And he's like, well, what's, what's going on? Let's do confession. I told him, well, I'm not Catholic. You know, I'm not fully Catholic. He's like, let's go. This is what you need. Because he understood the graces. He understood the graces. He understood the graces and the power he has as persona Christi to be able to do that. Because baptized Catholic, hey, you're Catholic, man. You're baptized. You're, if you're baptized Catholic, you're a Catholic, he told me. And so I'm like, all right, I receive that, especially in the circumstance. We have an extraordinary circumstance that I'm in right there. And so I'm telling him, you know what? I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. And, man, he stood up. He's probably like about six feet tall. He stands up and he's like, how dare you disrespect God? I'm like, what? Like, being in my head, like, what's he talking about? He's like, how dare you say that? You know God forgives you, but you can't forgive yourself. Whoa. And I was like, how can you say that God can forgive you, but you can't forgive yourself? Are you bigger than God? And I just, I, I understood what he was talking about. I understood God's love and mercy. I understood that I had to forgive myself to start moving forward. It doesn't mean that I had to forget what I had done wrong and that regret couldn't still live there because everybody could solve regret, but not having despair and unforgiveness um, living inside you, he, the point he was trying to get to me. And so he goes, you know what? I want to give you the body of Christ. I'm like, I looked through it. I had taken it before because I would act like I was Catholic and I would go in the line. But now I'm telling him, no, I'm not Catholic yet. You know that, Father. He's like, you're Catholic. This is what you need. You need Jesus. And right through the little bars like that, because we were like through a screen, their big old metal screen. He put it through there and gave it to me because I really believe he knew the efficacious graces that were going to be being bestowed upon me within the Eucharist, which is the life-giving power, the source and summit of our faith, that he knew Jesus was right there. And Jesus is going really to give me that strength to help me get through what I'm going through. Understand forgiveness. Be the sheep. He knew the mission that God was going to have before me. And he gave it to me. Boom. And that day, I remember, I it's not like it was in the blink of an eye it happened, but it was like gradually I became this stronger man. And then they only gave me, they only ended up giving me 10 years. So I was facing life in prison, and for about a year and a half, I fought it, studying. So I'm saying Dynamic Catholic, Ignatius Press, um, who else? Tan Books, Catholic Answers, my people right there, Catholic Answers. Bam, I was just with them last week. Side Khaled, uh, Chris, President Christopher Check, 
the boys over there at Catholic Answers. Yeah, I love those boys. They're cool. But they would send me all kinds of free literature, all kinds of free stuff. All these book Catholic book suppliers I'm talking about right now would send me free literature because I'm in prison. And it helped me grow stronger in my faith and read about my faith and apologetics. I really started getting into apologetics. I became like, you know, theology and apologetics, put them together. They're, it's perfect. They, they fit together. There's no way you can separate them. <clears throat> if you're in a theology, apologetics goes hand in hand. With, I think that's my thing. And so they end up sending me to prison. I only get 10 years. And I'm, man, I'm like, I couldn't believe it. When they told me I only got 10 years, I was like, I was happy, but I was sad. Because I had killed somebody and I, and I felt like I had deserved more time, but I felt like I didn't deserve a life. Like I felt like I deserved like 15 years, 85% or something like that. And they ended up giving me 10 years with 66%. So I would do six years and six months um, minus any time that I get knocked off from getting educated in good behavior. And so um, I go up to I go up to prison and that's where like things really start shifting in my life now because so now I get transferred up there when I go up to prison now now it's different because these guys have been studying theology for a long time these guys have been sitting in a monastery that's what happens in prison you're just there so you're studying you're getting all this stuff people are sending you the Protestants are sending Protestants stuff Jehovah Witnesses are sending the Jehovah Witnesses everybody's sending their people stuff and we just have hours to sit there and digest it and become the strongest version of ourselves possible possibly spiritually but knowledge is one thing putting it into action is a completely other thing and that's where it kind of falters with men in prison they obtain all this knowledge and then when we get out we don't apply it because we don't know how to apply it right anybody can learn something but if you're not given instructions on application on how to live it out you can learn a lot of stuff and it, it doesn't mean nothing i see it a lot of times with my brothers and sisters or just even people in general you know and so I end up going up to the prison, start studying, but there's no Catholics. There's no Catholics. But I told myself when I got up to prison, I would get college educated. I was going to get a degree. I was going to be in self-help groups. I was going to change. I was going to be more. I was going to do Bible studies. I was going to be more than just work out like I used to do before. A lot of working out, a lot of writing letters. I go, no. In order for me to change, I have to remove all this stinking thinking from my brain and now fill all these rooms that are empty up with beautiful things with god's graces with the knowledge of christ with theology with knowing about jesus in the bible so that i can share it with others and so i get up there there's no catholics so i started fellowshipping with the protestants because i want fellowship man like let's just be honest in there already it's probably like for the catholic faith we're like probably in the with, within christianity 37 or 30 70 in there and then that 30 percent of Catholics that are in there, probably 90% of them speak Spanish and the other 10% speak English. And, you know, they kind of know their theology. They kind of don't. So we didn't have any there. We didn't have math. I started stud studying with the Protestants. As a Catholic, though, you got to understand this. I'm just fellowshipping. Remember, I was a Protestant before, so I, I can do this without wanting to even go back. There is no way I'm going back at all. And so we start, I'm on the I'm on their worship team. So I'm, uh, the, I'm one of the leaders in their church. I'm preaching there because I preach. I'm a, I love preaching. I love evangelizing. I love getting in front of a group of people and just motivating them in the faith. That's my, that's my heart and soul right there. I love to evangelize. And so they gave me a forum to preach inside of there too. I was part of Toastmasters. But then all of a sudden, I'm in welding college, Bible college at the time. Toastmasters, you know, just doing a lot of great things, anger management, classic domestic violence, lifers group, gang members, anonymous, alcoholics, anonymous. Yeah, I'm doing everything. I'm And after, as time went on, I would facilitate them. So we're talking about three years of just straight packed down education, not just intellectually, but emotionally, um, you know, affectionately, just every part of me physically, um, spiritually was transforming while I was in there. And so Catholics do come on the yard. I see it one day. I'm out there working out on the yard, and I look over. And I'm like, "Who is that guy over there?" I see this tall black guy in all black suit with the blue, light baby blue, like one of those beach hats on. You know, you know all them Nigerians are. They be wearing those crazy colors sometimes. Our Nigerian priests, you know, our brothers and sisters. I love our Nigerian priests. And I ran across the yard, and yeah, his name was Father Titus Evie. 
And I felt so blessed that I would have a priest with me for the next three years, pretty much two and a half, three years of my life. I would be his facilitator. I would be his catechist. I would set up the altar. We only had him for four hours a week, two days a week. But I was the one always spending time with him. I was the one always around him. Uh, uh, work studies, Bible studies we would do. I would do Bible studies during the week. But I would always go to him and tell him, look, it, we're doing apologetics this day. Catholic video this day, Bible studies this day. I'm doing Bible studies every day. And he would kind of oversee me because I was the person on the yard that was looking over all the Catholic brothers and sisters, the Catholic brothers while we were in there. And I had a really great relationship with him. You know, he, he became a really good friend of mine. And so I was there for three years. He built me up, groomed me, confirmation I got. I got my first communion in there. I got my confirmation. We did it right. We bumped heads sometimes. We sharpened each other. I love Titus. <laughs> Excuse me. I love Father Titus. A very good, um, very good influence in my life. Really helped me grow into the person who I need to be today. And so three years, three, and remember this, this whole time I'm in there, it's like everyday study, everyday God. I'm living in a fishbowl. So everybody sees what I'm doing, how I'm talking, how I'm living. So I have to live in a manner that is worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ because people are waiting for you to fall, just like they're waiting for me to fall to this day. You know, it's just because who if you're one person in the past, yeah. they just think you're putting on this facade for such a long time. So my time comes, I'm getting out, I make a lot of good friends and brothers while I'm in there. I got a degree in social and behavioral science. I got a degree in Christian ministry slash theology from Harvest Bible University, which is an Anglican college. Um, victim offenders education group certified in, I'm a certified welder, and various other things while I was in there, other groups that I was doing to help myself grow. Confirmed Catholic, I actually got it on my wall right here. Um, and that was, that's like one of my most uh, important accomplishments is when I was confirmed Catholic because it, it transformed my identity. But then getting out, I had to plan, what am I going to do? How am I going to win? How am I going to succeed? How am I going to defeat the devil? I was just, just eight years before, just so many years before that I was calling out to him. Just so many years before that I was living in a demonic state. Just so many years before that I was, I was hateful. Come on. I was just. I was hurting every single person I was around. How am I going to change that? Because every other time I got out of prison before, I would fall back into my nonsense. Like I would do good while I was in prison, get out and do the same thing. Asceticism played an intricate part in this. Learning that I had to work out my salvation with fear and trembling played an intricate part in me preparing my plan. So when I got out of prison, Eric, it's not just going to be easy. Prepare for adversity. But know that in your weakness, God is made strong. You're going to get through this. You're going to win. There is no doubt. You are going to go out there because Christ always leads us to victory triumphantly. No doubt. And I had to set that in my mind that problems were going to happen, but we're going to go through this deal because God has me. He's brought me such a far ways. I shouldn't even be out right now. I don't deserve this life. But he was going to give me another chance of life. And I had to make sure that I, I had put down goals for the first time in my life. And I wrote them down and I was going to be successful and I wasn't going to lose. And God was on the top of that list. So the first thing I did when I got out of prison was I went to church. What year was this? I went to, what year? This was in, I got out in 2020. <laughs> May 3rd, May 3rd, 2020, I got out of prison during the heart of COVID. So the churches weren't even open. Nobody wanted to let me live with them. Somebody let me stay with them for like a week. And I was like struggling because I thought I was going to have somewhere to stay yeah. for like two months. Like, give me two months. I'm going to get a job. I'll be gone. Within one week, I was being told I can't stay somewhere. I was going to be on the streets. Um, I went to buy St. Joseph the Worker. It's in Loma Linda Church. And I was like, in my head, I was going to go back to my old friend's houses. I was going to go back to an old girlfriend's house because I had nowhere to live. I was going to go back to one of my old um, homeboys. Um, homes and go stay with them, which I know drugs are going to be there. And But instead, I dropped to my knees. I had learned something different this time. I learned how to battle from my knees and understand that when I give God everything that I am and, and what I need, okay, Lord, I'm going to humble myself before you. I'm going to cast all my cares upon you because you care for me, like it says in Peter. I know you're going to do the work. The next day I found a place and I was able to rent my own place on my own. 
the first time ever in my life I had ever rented my own place on my own. And this is a week. This is like a week and a half out of two weeks out of prison. Now I'm in, now I'm renting my own little like room. I'm renting a room somewhere, you know, in a in a home that has a lot of people in it. Now I have that going on. I'd never done that before. Sort of going to church, acclimating society. I've had the same job for three years now. I'm a welder fabricator. So I do that. Plus, I'm a full-time student at Cal State San Bernardino. But as I when I got out, it's still the struggle because you know what? I'm fully, like you've seen before, I'm fully sleeved down, even though I got a lot of religious art now. Jerusalem yeah. Cross. Nice. <laughs> Even though I got a lot of religious art all over my body, I covered all the gang tattoos with religious art, people still look at me different. You know, they, they see this on fire Catholic and they see what he's doing in my life. Because when I came out right now to live my life out of prison, it's not just me. My dad died. This is for my dad. Randolph Stevenson, I killed him. He should be with his family right now. August 19th, it just happened, you know. 2015 this has happened this is around the corner that's why i go hard that's why i give my complete all to god and i don't candy coat it and i'm gonna go deep and when people tell me oh slow down eric you know you're doing too much right now so i'm not doing enough i shouldn't even be out here right now jesus christ died for me on the cross and we as catholics we only want to give partial we don't want to give everything he gave us all what it says he who wants to come after me deny yourself because if you can't deny yourself, you can't come after me. Why? Because I gave everything for you. Because I won't deny you, even though you deny yourself. He wants us to be there right in the mix with him. He wants us to fight the good fight. Suffering comes from the cross, that vessel of forgiveness. I cannot come out here and just live a normal life. And just, oh, yeah, I'm going to go, to the movie, go on vacations and do the movies and do all these things that are different. No, I have to serve God every day. We have to serve him every day. He gave his life for us. And so how much, how they've softened our religion and softened it. You know, um, I just saw somebody, not to talk about it, but somebody just went to a Beyonce concert. One of the leaders in my church went to a Beyonce concert. Okay. I don't know if you know anything much on the whole background. Beyonce, she disrespects the church. She acts like she's God. They have some kind of Beyonce mask that disrespects Catholicism. And then I see one of my leaders go there and I see it a lot of times because Catholicism has been watered down. They are dissing our king. Stop wearing Dodger and Angel's gear if they're disrespecting our king. This is the seriousness of it, you know? I know it's supposed to be all love, everybody, enjoy. Jesus wasn't like that. He was turning over tables. He was whipping people, brutal vipers, you know? Even calling out his own friends when they weren't being right his own brothers, his own disciples, you know, and so coming out here, I have to go full-fledged, so, you know, whether it's Catholic Men's Fellowship, I'm a part of, they represent it right here, Catholic Men's Fellowship of California, my buddy Gil Aldredi, president, um, Knights of Columbus, lecturing at church, pro-life ministry, going to pro-life events, El Sembrador, which is the sower ministry, a big charismatic movement that's around the whole world, being a part of them, evangelizing. I love to speak. I probably, I love to share Jesus. I love to share what Christ has done in my life. I love to share the works of Christ in my life because without that, there's nothing. I wouldn't be here talking to you right now if it wasn't for Christ. I wouldn't be doing none of this because I'm a nobody. Just trying to tell everybody all about somebody who saved my soul. And Jesus Christ saved my soul. I don't want the lie. I don't want people to look at, oh, Eric. No, I want them to see Christ and what he did on the cross. And that's what's transformed my life and brought me to being the person who I am today. Board of directors at my college, a student representative, Catholic Newman Club, devout Catholic that always wears sacramentals, always is represented 24-7. Because when people see you wearing this, your Benedict Cross, miraculous medals, rosaries, when you're doing it, you are representing for the king. We are representing for God. When we start getting, understanding that this is a war and we are battling every single day against the enemy and we need to start representing for him because when he was on the cross, every single one of you out there, he was representing for you. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Every single one of us so that we can overcome and become stronger Catholics. So not just so we can have a happy and joyful life and be full of peace, so that we can fight the good fight of faith.
so that we can be there for our brothers, bear our brothers and sisters' burdens, help them to get through the things that they're going through. You know, I'm a just, if I can just be that living example of the power of God, Brother Eddie, I just, I want to be able to share it. And, uh, you know, I thank you for having me on here because right now it's just, it's just a part of my journey. It's only been three years and three months that all this has been going on. I own my YouTube channel, The Traditional Urban Christian. So if anybody out there sees it, I, I hope that me and Brother Eddie right here will be working together more in the future Amen. and doing things Amen. and talking with one another, maybe having him on my show, we'll talk about apologetics, the faith, how to fight the fight, spiritual warfare. Um, I just I would really enjoy it because this is what it's all about. Being a saint. What else is there to live for? It's Amen. Wow, man. Fantastic. OK, so one thing that came yeah. to my mind is for you were back in prison. Mm hmm. And you're doing all the Bible studies, you're hanging out with your priest friend. How did you stay away from, I guess, the politics of the system? Because what you had described before, how you had to be a certain person or you're going to get your, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're going to get destroyed. Yeah, so, how how so did you, I, how did you, I guess, have that buffer? <laughs> so I, I just made the righteous decision just to ask them that I want to be out, you know? Just that I don't want to be a part of that no more. And then things, one thing led to another, and I got sent to yards that were actually a little more slack. So I got sent to yards that weren't as heavy as those yards. Yeah. And so I was able to ask them, hey, you know, like, hey, I'm I'm not about this. This is this isn't what I'm playing. I'm this is what I'm playing. And so that's why even more people would watch me. Because if you are saying that you're not going to do that, you can't do nothing wrong. Wow. You know, like if, if you're going to go for Christ, you can't go. If you can't go and then want to go gamble over here, you can't go for Christ. And then you're over here cussing and cheating or stealing or whatever they whatever other things they're doing and trying to get involved in the politics in there and stuff. Um, but it was it, it, it flowed smoothly. There was a few times where I had to protect people where I really didn't want to. Who I was before I was Catholic, I could care less about certain individuals that are incarcerated that are getting beat up because of their crimes because certain crimes that they would have and i'm like hey they deserve it they did this let them get that um but this time was the first time within my within starting to convert to catholicism that i started defending people with bad crimes got it and defending them why because christ forgave me yeah so how could i be the person who just received forgiveness for murdering somebody yep and this person over here even though i think what he did was sick or wasn't, a, a, you know, I don't think it was, you know, I think he deserved it. I had to stop that person now. Because just like me, just like Jesus being on the cross, the thief being forgiven, that man deserves forgiveness too. Yep. If he's asking for forgiveness and saying, man, I'm sorry I did this. I would hear some crazy stories too. People would tell me they started confiding in me. A lot of people did. You know, they started confiding and I would write letters to their families because they didn't people men don't know how to write, teaching men how to write and read while I'm in there, really just utilizing my time in the best manner possible while getting into a lot of debates. The debates were always good. I, I enjoyed having Muslims and um, Jehovah Witnesses and the Mormons and the Protestants, Calvinists around me because, yeah, I was just talking to my buddy as a Calvinist the other day. He's in prison still, but I'm still trying to convert him. Little by little, by showing him my example, you know, by living this example of who I am in Christ and what I'm doing out here, because who who would have thought that this could be happening in my life? But only God, only his mercy, only Jesus Christ dying on the cross for us can do this. Only he could say, OK, you know what? I'm going to take you from where you were for such a long time and I'm going to change you. Yep. It's like that man, in De like that man in Decapolis. You know, Decapolis, or there's two names for that area where he's at. He's living amongst the graves. He's over there, Jehernis, or uh, well, I forgot what it was, but he's over there living amongst the graves, and he has a legion of demons in him. Oh, yeah, yeah. I think it's Decapolis. That's one of the names they use for his two different two different cities they have it in, um, two different gospels. And so he has a thousand demons, and only Jesus, him falling at the foot of Jesus, is he able to get healed? That's why every time I take the Eucharist, I drop to my knees. I take the Eucharist in my mouth. I take it on my knees because that's my king. Even when they just open the tabernacle, like I know when he when they lift it up like this, that's when everybody drops. Okay, when the priest does that, when they open the tabernacle, I'm dropping to my knees. 
Because that's my king. He's present. Why not? So that's why I do that. Um, um, I just think it's a it's it's beautiful the way we show this reverence and admiration to the Eucharist because we're showing that admiration to Jesus. We're showing it to the power of God yeah. that can develop and transform us and sharing it with others. What is it if I love the Eucharist and I go take the Eucharist and I don't share the Eucharist with others? Only 25% of the church believes in the true presence. We need to start talking about these things. It needs to be discussed seriously, um, you know, not just global warming and stuff. <laughs> no, I think it's changing. I really do. I think that there's this, the the revival is, the Eucharistic revival specifically. Uh, I'm very, very uh, optimistic. And I think that there are a lot more people talking about defending the 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 true presence more than i've yeah. seen in in recent years that's for sure yeah. um last question yeah, i'm a eucharistic evangelist too so fantastic yeah. it's a title we have for the revival for the revival yeah yeah um, uh, so you took us on the craziest ride unbelievable what and you may have already said it if you were to meet 15 year old you or 20 year old you, I don't know if that would vary that that differently. What would you what would be the core message to that kid? To the kid that's all he knows is drugs, all he knows is, you know, going from place to place. Maybe all he knows is just going into juvenile hall. Um would how would you address that kid if you had him in front of you? You know, it's like it's like a lot of kids that I talk to. For me myself, to be honest with you, I would I wouldn't want him to change nothing, first of all. Because the person who God's produced right now through the fire is someone that I would have never been before. Wow. If it wouldn't if it wouldn't have been through all the things that I've been through, all the pain and hurt that I had taken in over all the years, all the things that I had seen, all the things that I had done, and then to and then to hurt people and to understand God's forgiveness and love. I don't think I would be on fire like this if it wasn't for all those things that would happen. But I would just I would just remind him never to give up. You know, just like I tell a lot of kids, don't give up, you know. I try to remind them to believe in themselves, that they're not in this, they're not in this fight by themselves. And that they didn't do nothing wrong, you know, don't blame themselves for where they're at in life, but also don't hate and become angry to where it takes you away further away from the reality of how your life could be. Because um, sometimes we go through these events and it hurts us and it makes us worse because these hurts, habits and hangups that we go through in our life, it really takes an effect on who we are as a person, especially when we're children, you know, and I'll just I'll just tell them the fight's not over. Keep on fighting. It's a good adventure. You know, if I'm talking to myself, it's a good adventure. Don't give up. Seek God. You know, I really, I would really push Catholicism. I was just telling my son the other day, I wish I was Catholic when I was younger. I wish I was Catholic when I was younger. I wish I understood the, the faith. But then if I would have never gone through what I've gone through and all the conversions and conversions to different denominations and even the conversions that I went through mentally. Yeah. Even the conversions, all these different conversions and people I went through that I became over all the years, you know, of the incarceration, all the things that I've done, um, all of those too, you know, like I would just I would just tell them to stay focused on Jesus, you know, because when not without all those things, I wouldn't be who I am today. That's a good question right there. But I wouldn't be who I am today. Embrace who you are. Become the best version of yourself possible today. That's what I'm trying to do. Like I can't, I can't change or try to manipulate what happened in the past. But what I can do is become the best Catholic version of myself possible today. And it's like a program that I've been talking about. Just to, to add this to it, it's a program that I do. It's called cross training. The, I talk about the four points of the cross. There are four points on this cross, right? Do you know what cross training is? Cross training is a CrossFit. You work out, you know. Have you oh, you're saying, you're asking what is actually, yeah, I thought you were talking about yeah, the yeah, program. Yeah, so yeah. you've heard that one. So you've heard that one. Okay, yeah, awesome. Because yeah. it's a complete body workout. 
So no matter where, what part of your body you're working, it's not going to fall out. Why? Because I'm working my legs. I'm working my calves. I'm working my thighs. I'm working my chest. I'm working my back. I'm working my arms. I'm working my stomach. It's complete. Cross training is a spiritual workout now. Because a physical workout benefits us this much, we know that the spiritual workout profits in abundance. But how do I work it? How do I do it? How do I keep it in the core of my mind? And so I came out with a program called Cross Training. Four points of the cross. The four points that Catholics need to do to become the best Catholic version of themselves possible. Top part of the cross is Jesus. Having a relationship with the Eucharist and Jesus Christ. Believing truly in the body, blood, soul, and divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. But putting him before everything. He's the king. He is the name that is above all names. He died for us. So on the top of the cross, the source and summit of our faith, Jesus Christ, the Eucharist, because that's who it is. And it's really having a relationship with it. And I break it down more. I'm just paraphrasing yeah. real quick, okay? Yeah. So the top of it is Jesus Christ, remembering this. This is Jesus. I need him every day. Who was at the foot of the cross? Mother. Mm Mother Mary was at the foot of the cross. So having a devotion to Mama Mary, because we know that Mama will do anything for her son. Even when it was in her time to do miracles, she still did it for him. Uh, he still did it for her. Why? Because she wiped his boo-boos. She taught him how to speak. She tucked him away to go to sleep. She cooked him all his meals. She fed him. She taught him the scriptures because we know that mama knew the scriptures too. Luke 2, she was Luke 2 or Luke 1, she was proclaiming the scriptures right there in the Magnificat. That's that old Magnificat from Hannah right there. So we know she knew it. But also at the same time as having a devotion to Mama Mary, praying your 60 canon rosary. This is our 60 bead rosary, our 60 millimeter rosary right here. 60 millimeter cannon. Why? Because That's I have a 60 beautiful beads. rosary. Oh my yeah, god. Yeah, and there and there's 60 beads on it. That's why I call it my 60. You know, like a nine millimeter yep. is a gun, right? Yep. This has 60 beads on it, so I call it my 60 millimeter. It is the greatest weapon we have right now, Padre Peel says, to defeat the enemy. The devil is that a, rug is that a rugged rosary? It is somebody from Catholic Answers gave it They're to me. Yeah, it is a really fantastic good rosary. man. That'll last. Yeah, yeah, a it is. Yeah, that's that. The Maria right here. Yeah, I got a. Uh, what is it called? Let me see. Let me move this real quick. I got this one and then an Archangel Michael the Archangel. What's up? Can you see it? In M. Yep. Ave yep. Maria. Yep. Yeah. So the top. So then we got the bottom of the cross is devotion to Mama Mary, praying the Rosary, and believing it. Like you could take the Eucharist and you could pray the rosary, but if you don't have faith, it doesn't mean nothing. True. Anybody could do ritualistic things. Yep. But when you do ritualistic things with faith, that's what activates it. Every single person that was healed, it was through the faith that was healed. Jesus said it over and over and over again. Over Our and faith over and makes over it right. Yeah. Yeah. So then we have the left side. So faith makes the Eucharist strong in you. Remember that it gives you the mm, life with the Eucharist. No Eucharist, no life. Rosary, get it. It's graces, fight against the devil. Given to St. Dominic, I believe, in 1208 AD to fight against heretics, false teachers. Yeah, so that's why, that and the devil. That's why the rosary was given to us. So the right side of the cross is reading the Bible. It's a Catholic book. The Bible is a Catholic book. Nobody else's book. We preserved it. Let's start reading it. Let's start getting it in it every single day. It is the word of God. Because when I pray my rosary, it's how I talk to God. But, and when I read the Bible, it's how God talks to me. Because like St. Jerome says, to be ignorant of scripture is to be ignorant of Christ. Because that's how we get to know more about Christ, is by reading the Bible. It is a Catholic book. It's like Peter Kreft says, where's my Bible at? Peter Kreft says, a Bible, somebody who's a Bible who's a Bible that's falling apart. You see, it's all broken up and got tape all over. It's my did my Didache Bible right here, but it's all taped up and stuff. Awesome. But a a Bible that's falling apart is usually owned by somebody who isn't, because you're getting edified by God every single day. There's that is the bread of life, not just taking the Eucharist, but we also have the Word to feed us too. 
to nourish our mind, to nourish our spirit also along with the Eucharist and the rosary. Read it every single day. We need the scriptures and know your doctrine. Know your faith. Get little quiz games. I got a little card quiz game. It's like a Catholic quiz. If you guys got to learn your faith, right. the more you know about your Catholicism, yeah. the more you're going to be empowered. When somebody asks you, why is Jesus still on the cross? Why do we have Jesus on the rosary? What is the rosary? Why do we do the sign of the cross? You can explain it like this and break it down to them because once you have answers, they can't say nothing. Come back with an answer instead of just like, I don't know, or confused. But if you know about what you're wearing or why you're doing it or why we believe it, it empowers you to become stronger. And that's the first step in winning this battle is knowing your faith too. So like I said, doctrine, Bible, and then the left side of it, the last part of the cross would be evangelization and ministry. Like evangelization, preaching it, sharing. It's all our job to preach. It's all our job to share it. However manner you do it, it's all our opportunity. Because if I'm wearing this and I'm going down the street, I'm evangelizing. Why? Because somebody sees this on me. You don't have to be preaching with words like St. Francis says, preach the gospel at all times. And if necessary, use words. Your actions should be everything. But actually do it representing. If you're not preaching Christ, but do it by wearing um, one of the sacramentals. Um, just really believing in it and sharing it. But also on top of that, being involved in liturgical ministry, men, men or women. But I'm just saying, let's get out there and serve. Let's get out there and be a part of it. Let's be an example. Somebody's looking at you, whether it's your kids, whether it's your friends, whether it's somebody in the church that looks up to you. Join a ministry. Be involved because now you're setting the tone. Because if you're doing it, now the next person is going to want to do it. And we are the body of Christ. Right. We need yep. to edify and build each other up. Yes. That's cross training. I love it. <laughs> oh man, what a blessing. Thank you for the two hours we spent together. Um, I look forward to chatting more. And everyone, traditional urban Christian on YouTube. And you can find everything you need about Eric there. And I want to thank you again, my brother. And I want to thank everyone for listening. As I always say, please share this testimony. Please comment about this testimony. Please take what Eric was saying. Like, I'm going to go back. The first one was so dramatic for me and so helpful. The first part of the testimony and then not knowing what was coming up in this. Uh, you rocked me twice, man. So I just want to encourage everyone after you watch it, go back. I think Eric had some incredible nuggets of wisdom in there. Um, and as he said, he would only be able to get those through some insane circumstances pray for everyone um all the victims that he mentions like you know and everyone in your family eric that has passed mm -hmm. let's just pray for everyone that was part mm -hmm. of this incredible um roller coaster and yeah let's let's offer let's offer some some prayers for the entire journey so that eric is also strengthened as he continues to get out there and speak to people that need to hear the gospel. So um, until next time, take care and God bless. Bye. Thank you. God bless you too, brother. Bye.